Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the PDST interview series. Today, I get to talk with a friend of mine, a guy by the name of David Roach. David's an author, he's a martial artist, he's been doing a lot of things, and I'm really excited about this. So, David, thanks for being here with me. Hey, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. It has been, and, and we're actually going to do something a little different today. Usually, I just do the interview. Today, you actually have some interview questions for me as well. Is I do, right? absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, I, I, again, I think uh, people are going to be really interested in what you do as well, and I want them to know what, what your sword fighting school has to offer. Well, fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, now, if I remember correctly, your aunt is Tina. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We met because your aunt was our chiropractor at one point. And if I remember correctly, you were significantly younger at the time. <laughs> I was. I think I was, I was maybe uh, 26 years old. Yeah. So it's been a while. It's great to finally be able to catch up with you again. Absolutely. Now, you are an author, and you write a series of books called Marauder. Can you tell us what Marauder is about? Is it, does it follow one person or is it like an anthology or can you tell us a little bit about the series? Yeah, absolutely. So Marauder is certainly a saga. It is following one specific character or one protagonist and his name is Auden and he's meant to be a Viking warrior essentially. Um, the stories, the stories um, are not uh, strictly historical. They are certainly fiction where you have maybe historical accuracy related to Vikings, their weapons, the way that they live, the way that they traveled. And then you have the actual gods, mythology, monsters, uh, Odin, Fenrir, Thor, those uh, individuals get inserted very, very real into the books. And that's where it gets interesting. And that's where you start getting into the fiction aspect of, of my stories. So the, the hero, the protagonist, much of his story is not only overcoming the challenges of living in the dark ages or the medieval ages, but also, you know, overcoming the gods and the things that they're doing and the obstacles that they're putting in front of people. So as you very well know, living in the medieval ages, so you had, uh, you know, lack of food, lack of drinkable water, you had disease, no medical care, a simple cut um, could get infected and kill you essentially very quickly. Um, death at sea was very easy, hypothermia, exposure to the, the environment, right? The environment itself was constantly trying to kill you in medieval times. So not only is the, the protagonist dealing with those challenges, but he's also dealing with the gods who, you know, tend to be very angry, very vengeful, and essentially have all the worst traits that human beings have. And the gods have a very nasty sense of humor. They do, absolutely. I, I really enjoy, you know, I know that they have the Marvel, the Marvel concept of Loki. Um, it's not terribly far off from what the, the Norse version uh, is in mythology, except he's more of a, a troublemaker. He likes, he likes chaos for chaos sake. Um, he's not necessarily a bad guy, but he can be a bad guy. Right, and uh, the, the original Thor, is quite a bit different than the Marvel Thor. Yes, ab absolutely. I think he's. I think he's got a beer belly, uh, usually described with re long red hair. Um, tends to be very easily triggered or up upset. He hasn't. He certainly has an anger problem. Um, and at one point, there's even a story where he cross dresses, which is rather interesting. That that people may not be aware of that mythology but he's i believe in that story he's trying to get his hammer back he's with loki trying to get his hammer back. yeah so he pretends to be a goddess and marry a giant a nice yeah guy. And so exactly he's dressed as a bride exactly i don't see chris himworth doing that however, no however to be fair um it was done by sean connery and zardoz was it he cross-dressed in a wedding dress in Zardo. Wow. Well, bra bravo, trying to keep it as historically accurate as possible to the mythology. I mean, yeah, you also don't, you know, you also don't see Loki, you know, bre breeding with a horse, right, um, right. In, the, in the Marvel movies. So, you know, Norse mythology, for people who don't really read into it, it's very odd. 
it is for, you know compare it compared to maybe what our modern concepts or understanding of myth and religion might be it is extremely odd it is extremely colorful it is filled with a lot of really weird characters that do a lot of very strange things compared to today's standards um, so I would certainly I would certainly recommend anybody who has the opportunity to actually read Norse mythology to do so and to do so deeply because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of it and there's a lot of a lot of detail to go through. I'd actually like to put in a little plug here for a professor who does a wonderful job on this, Dr. Jackson Crawford. He has a lot of videos mm -hmm. on YouTube into mm -hmm. the Norse mythology and reading ancient Norse, and it's fantastic to listen to them. Uh, but the Nordic gods are 100% different from the Christian god. It is quite the difference. Yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have, you know, some, so, you know, some of the, the big differences, too, is one, of course, you've got one god versus many gods, right? The other thing, too, is that the Norse gods are usually don't tend to preach things like mercy, forgiveness, um, you know, a lot of the, I want to say, what are the, the, the Christian values, right? right. Uh, Norse mythology, to me, when I initially started studying it, reminds me a lot of Greek mythology. Again, where you have these gods that have, they're very jealous and very spiteful and very angry. They have a lot of, a lot of the worst traits of human beings, right? right. And I think in, in a lot of ways, what that does is that that tells a story, right? Is that it gives, I think it gives the reader um, a, a story to read to understand things that they shouldn't do in real life or certain traits that might not be admirable in the real world and how you might want to handle certain situations differently than maybe the Norse gods did. Yeah, they're, they're a bit, they tend to be a bit, bit petty at times. Yeah, absolutely. My yeah, and that's, and that, go ahead. My favorite um, example of the Norse gods is actually not in the Norse, gods that we read about today it's actually in conan when conan prays to crom crom i've never talked to you and if you don't listen to me then to hell with you that's basic there's the nordic gods right there yeah exactly and 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 we still don't know very much about you know their kind of uh i guess i want to call them religious practices right i'll give i'll give a plug to you know cj adrian if you've ever had an opportunity to read any of his works um you know CJ uh, does a lot of study into Norse archaeology, Norse history, um, and in speaking with him, it, it's rather interesting that there's just a lot that we don't know about Vikings. There's a lot that we don't know about the Norse people because they did not have a written language. They did not have, uh, you know, papyrus, you know, pages and pages of papyrus or written works or, or books for that matter. Um, they did have runes. They had rune stones. But, you know, the runes, for the most part, especially during the Viking Age, um, you know, they were more attributed to uh, spells or magical powers. And they were, you know, they were only carved into stone. And they really only described probably some of the most important events or the biggest events in, um, you know, Scandinavian history. They really did not cover what it was like day to day. We don't know if they really prayed to their gods. We don't know, you know, we, you see these videos where people are doing sacrifices, right? And that's kind of the big thing. You see the pagans doing the sacrifice. We don't really know if, if that was a common practice or if that was something that was just a part of one particular group, you know? Um, and so that's, it, leave, it leaves a lot of mystery and a lot of mist kind of over them. So for me, it's, as a writer, especially when I'm doing fiction, that gives me a lot of license to be creative and do fun things without being afraid that I'm going to um, really go against the grain or really upset people that I'm taking so much license yeah. with these stories. But again, you've read, you've read Norse mythology, obviously. You're familiar with it, and you're familiar with how strange it is. Um, example I could use is I could say, you know, like stories from Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter was a really interesting series in that very commonplace items or commonplace things were not so common. They, they had a lot of strange attributes, like pictures. Pictures would talk to you. The stairs would move, for example. Nothing was ever what it seemed. And I think a lot of that is really similar in Norse mythology. And so that's where I take a lot of my stories. And I will make things very interesting. I will take a, a random object and I'll imbue it with maybe it's actually holding the the essence of a witch or what they called a, a vulva 
you know, in in uh, Scandinavian history, essentially. You also call it, they also call it a seeress. There's a slight difference. Volva is a witch. Usually they have magical powers. Seeress is usually somebody that uh, can see into the future, that somebody might provide you counsel or, or guidance on things. What do you find most interesting about writing in this genre? I think... I think the most interesting thing again is is really just with it's with the creative license. It's that you have these these characters that have stayed with us through the ages, right? You have you have Thor, you have Odin, but then you maybe have you know you have Loki, but you have less known figures, and there's a lot of them, right? Balder, uh, Freya, Frey, Tyr, right? All of these characters are really interesting. They have very rich backgrounds. You also have a lot of monsters, and that's where I, I've been playing a lot with that in Norse mythology in my books, is that I include things like giants, yeah. right? Joan Toon, those are awesome to write about. Um, I include strange creatures like elves, but they're not elves like Lord of the Rings, right? They're elves the way that Norse mythology you know, portrayed them. Um, and you have different, you know, kind of different races of different creatures, right? So you can have, for example, you can have uh, a giant that lives in the woods. You have another one that, you know, resides under the ground. You also have dwarves. Uh, dwarves were also very different in Norse mythology than what Tolkien had shown. I love Tolkien's rendition of dwarves, but it's very, very different from what the rendition is in Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, there's also... Um, we, they suspect that dwarves and elves are, were essentially the same thing. They may have just been a different race. And some of the descriptions that they use, really interesting with dwarves is, you know, they definitely talk about smithing, right? They were blacksmiths. They were craftsmen. They made, you know, they made weapons. They made the most beautiful jewelry and armor in existence. Um, and because of that, because they were constantly underground and they were doing this, their skin was black. Right from the ash, from the soot of being a blacksmith, and I know you know I'm sure you're aware that same thing with folks during the medieval times. If you were a blacksmith, your hands and your forearms were probably pretty black most of the time, just dot dyed black from the soot and the ash, and a lot of your body probably appeared pretty tan compared to everybody else around you. Um, so we kind of assume because we don't know for sure, but we assume that that's where some of the the you know the real life stuff got roped into the, mytholo the Norse mythology. Okay. What do you find the most challenging about writing in this genre? The being able to portray the, the realistic portion of Scandinavian culture or Norse culture during that time. That's very, very difficult. Um, you get a lot of people, so Vikings, the show Vikings. I love that show. I've gotten to meet some of the actors awesome people so this is nothing against them <laughs> but you know that show you know they, they're all portrayed as you know medieval bikers right they're all wear they're all wearing black leather and they, they all look really cool and some of these guys have you know just crazy tattoos everywhere and they're all you know they're all very some of them are or a lot of them are very large and very muscular um that that wasn't very realistic for the time so one of course is that food was scarce and you spent a lot of your time and energy burning calories to get food. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps and we were spending all of our time being very, very active, it didn't matter how much food we ate, we always stayed very skinny um, because we were, we were constantly burning calories. So the way that people looked was probably very different. They were, you know, they were probably, they were certainly muscular and certainly tough, um, but they were not large by any means. They did not have gym bodies. That was probably really unrealistic. Maybe one in a hundred guys or less, you know, had, had those features just because of good genes or good genetics, right? Um, you know, some of the other stuff is the clothing. I just mentioned the biker gang look. Uh, Norse clothing, as far as we can tell, was, it was very basic. Um, it was also very attuned to the environment, right? They didn't want to die. They wanted to stay warm. Uh, they used a lot of wool, for example. Um, some of the skins you always see in the movies, the guy's wearing a bear skin or he's wearing... Um, you know, he, usually a skin of a large predator of some kind. Most of the time they're wearing skins of animals that they were farming, right? So they had goat skins, for example. That was really, really common. If you were a hunter or if you went out and killed an animal, yeah, you could probably acquire one of these skins yourselves and you could use that on a day-to-day -day basis. 
but most of them were not draping, you know, large furs over them. If anything, they were taking those furs and putting them in the lining of their clothing a lot of times. Um, and then also the, the skill set. So my books still very much focus on the warriors because that's just what I enjoy. That's what I like to write about. It's fun. Um, less than 1% of uh, Norsemen were actually Vikings. Vikings were pirates. They were, uh, they were raiders. They were the second, third, and fourth sons of a household that were not given um, the property and all of the assets when their father died. So they decided to go make their own fortunes by raiding, essentially. And that's the way they, they made their living. So most people were tradesmen. Most people were blacksmiths, fishermen, uh, farmers. Farmers would have been probably the most common. Uh, you know, people working, uh, woodworking, lumber or shipwrights working on the long ships. You know, Vikings had the greatest ships at the time. And they didn't do it just by having a small handful of shipwrights. They had a lot of people that were working at the docks and, you know, chopping down lumber and building these boats. And they were doing it all by hand. More like almost an army of shipwrights. Yeah, exactly. I remember reading something somewhere that one of the reasons that the Saxons so hated the uh, Scandinavians, other than, you know, coming in and killing them and taking their things, other than that, <laughs> other than that. Uh, their women really liked them because they took care of themselves. They carried combs everywhere. They combed their hair. They, they kept themselves clean. Mm -hmm which is again yeah. against that biker look yeah there there are there are several um historical texts or documents that that attest to that i can't think of them offhand right now but yes they it wasn't it wasn't like the english or i guess they weren't the english at the time but you know i'll use mercia as an example you know folks that lived there during that time uh, i think the tradition was a once a year bath usually yeah. i can't imagine yeah. Right. I mean, I can't, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine a once a year bath, whereas the Scandinavians, um, they were bathing rather often, but actually more, more than bathing, they were using, I guess you, you, you could call it bathhouse, but a, a steam house essentially. Yeah, sauna. So, and exactly. And they were doing that. I mean, that's one way to get out of the cold and to fix those sore muscles. And that's yeah. great. And that's also another way to stay clean. That was, that was really, really common for the, the, the Norse people at the time. That's fantastic. And when you're doing your research for a new story, do you pick a mythological event or activity and then build a story around that? Or do you build a story and then pick and choose what you're looking for from the history and the mythology? Yeah, so a, lo a lot of it has to do with planning, right? So when I wrote my first book, I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you, I did not plan very well. Um, you know, I was really just starting to learn how to be a writer. And I, I started it because I wanted to do something for myself for once. Um, and it, it was something that I was good at in high school, really without trying. I'm like, you know, I'll try to be a writer. And, you know, of course, I submitted my first manuscript to my uh, editor, Kara Lockwood, who's a, a New York Times bestseller. And she beat the crap out of me on my first novel. She redlined everything. And I learned a lot from her. And that really helped in, in the first novel and the following novels. Um, so I've learned a lot along the way. Planning is key. Um, I really try to create my story now around the story of Ragnarok. So everything that's okay. happening is essentially leading up to the end of the world or what people would currently call the apocalypse, right? Ragnarok is the end of the world. Um, and so that's where the stories are leading. But as I built the stories, Marauder was the first series I started writing. I've written three books in that, in that series. I have a fourth that's going to come out uh, by the end of the year called Trials of Asgard. Um, and I've also created another book called Runebinder. And Runebinder is, that, Runebinder is actually a story of a different character, but the exact same world, exact same time. He's just in a different location dealing with his own challenges. And this character is, we'll say, more of a, a wizard or magician type character, okay. essentially. He's, he's a young boy who's coming into his own, just now realizing he has these magical powers and he has to work with uh, essentially a, a wizard, we, we'll call him, um, to, to learn these powers, right? To learn the powers of the runes and how he can use those to cast magical spells, essentially. Nice. So it's, all, it's almost like a Norse or Scandinavian version of Harry Potter, just much darker, much more adult, much more violent, right? 
Um, and oh, that's I can't that wait tends to pick that one up. Yeah, that tends to be my book. So so Rune, it's great because what I've done is I'm I'm almost creating almost like a Marvel universe type thing, right? Where eventually I'm going to have several characters in their own uh, regions, their own challenges. They're going to go through their storyline, and then eventually, once I have four books in each of those each of those sagas, uh, they'll merge into a single like Avengers Assemble, right? Nice. Uh, so and that'll and that final series that'll be the Ragnarok series and it's just going to be three books in that one just to close it out and you know we'll we'll see where all of our all of our adventures end up in that one so that's you know that's all the you know that's all the Norse mythology the Scandinavian works that I'm doing I'm also doing some other stuff I wrote a Civil War book that was a lot of fun that one's called uh, When the Drums Stop and that one is actually based on one of my ancestors uh, Anderson Roach. Anderson Roach served in the volunteer cavalry in Tennessee during the last two years of the Civil War. Um, so I wrote I wrote that book actually following a lot of his battles. Um, I could not write about every battle because he had about 422 engagements over wow. a two two year period. Yeah, I mean it was pretty intense. So I really just focused on the big battles and kind of the the important um, the important times that he dealt with. That one's you know purely historical fiction. There's no magic, no yeah. fantasy in that one. Um, a lot of it can be pretty, um, you know, shocking and depressing, the reality of, of the Civil War. But these are the kind of books that I like to write. I like writing these books where you have these protagonists that, you know, one, they don't really want to be the hero, right? right? They're just, you know, they think they're just going on an adventure, doing their thing. They're kind of selfish to begin with. And they're having to learn a lot of the hard lessons that adults have to learn as they're progressing through these trials. The same thing in the Civil War book. You have a boy who thinks, well, I'm going to go on an adventure and go fight the Civil War, you know, and say, say the United States. A lot of boys thought that when they joined the Civil War and just kind of the, the terrible realities of, again, dealing with the environment, trying not to, you know, die from heat exhaustion, you know, from all the heat and humidity in the South, trying not to die from uh, exposure to the cold during the winter. Dysentery. Um, dysentery, yep. Sickness, illness from sitting in the camp, from that close proximity. We talk about social distancing right now. Um, you know, that that's that's a very real thing. Even in the Marine Corps, even in the military, we had plenty of times where, you know, you'd have an entire barracks would get sick with, you know, different types of diseases just because we we're all very close to each other all the time and you constantly need to be sanitizing things um, in order to avoid people from getting sick. And then on top of all those natural elements that are in the way they're already making life hard enough now you got people trying to kill you and yeah. that that just is the icing on the cake in a lot of ways um so that's that's why you know i really enjoy you know kind of writing these stories that show people overcoming these these terrible obstacles but then again also making people aware of the reality of some of these things where yeah like a lot of characters die a lot of people die of like i, I love george martin where He's just not afraid to kill people off. I try to very much do the same thing in my books where, you know, I'll take a character. I have, a, I have another book that I'm, you know, wanting to write here pretty soon called The, the, the Tales of the Highwayman. And this is going to be, a, you know, basically a, a 17th century scoundrel that's robbing people. In the very beginning of the book, you, you think the hero is getting ready to go out on an adventure and go save somebody. And that guy gets stabbed within the first two pages and dies on the road because the highwayman comes in, explains that he's the char he's the lead character of the story and he's not a good guy. Right? You know, that almost reminds me of Abercrombie. Yeah. Have you, yep. have you read any of his books? I have, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nine Fingers. I love, the, love his books. Uh, speaking of battles and the truth of it, you were a Marine, I was Army. There is a... There's a camaraderie that's built when you are with your guys. And, and they are, by, by definition, your guys. Yep. Is that built into your books? Yeah, absolutely. I have. So almost all my books have usually have the protagonist, and he usually has a, I want to call it a core group of, of friends, right? So you know, my, each of my stories has a protagonist. That protagonist has... A core group of friends, right? A a, cir a circle of trusted people, right? Here's the circle. Trusted people are in the circle. Everybody else is outside, right? Yeah, that's right. And you know, he's, he's, they usually have best friends because honestly, we can't do a lot of these very difficult things um, without help, right? No, nobody is an island unto themselves. They're not. Right. They need help. They need people to help. You know, push them forward. And that happens in the stories. And a lot of times in these stories, you'll see some of the reality that. 
you know, these brothers make sacrifices for you. Um, and some of them die, right? It, it happens. And their deaths help propel that character forward. It helps push them forward. Same thing in the military. Nothing gets done by yourself. Everything is done as a team. And win or lose, it's all done as a team. And at the end, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's going to be the guy behind you and the guys next to you that you know, is going to be really what counts, right? And you're doing it for them. Right, because you, I mean, you, you get into a bad situation. You know, politics. Um, you know, who's right, who's wrong, all these things. Uh, as soon as the first bullet gets fired or the first axe gets swung, all that shit goes out the fucking door. Because you have people that are trying to kill you, right? You have yeah. pe- and trying to hurt and trying to hurt your friends too, right? So you're just trying to get out of that situation, and it's literally living in the moment, right? It's dealing from moment to moment to moment, trying to get through it, and then those. And then in between those moments, you have days, months of boredom, yeah. right? You have lots of walking, lots of farming, foraging, hunting, um, a lot of the stuff that people don't talk about, right? Or we talk about the Civil War or even the military, just sitting in camp or being in garrison, being at the barracks. Uh, a lot of that can be very boring. A lot of it, and that's why a lot of guys get in trouble in the military too because, you know, they, you know they'll end up drinking too much or, you know, they, they end up doing drugs or, you know, just in general doing something they shouldn't be because they're bored. Most of your time in the military um, is spent in boredom. You know, in my books, I try to reflect some of that, but obviously I don't want to, you know, bore my readers. I want them to All keep right. turning the pages. I want them to keep going. But I do allude to a lot of those things where they spend, you know, a month in camp doing nothing but drinking whiskey and playing cards, right? <laughs> or we skip ahead and we say, oh, you know, now we've, now we've arrived at winter and we just spent, you know, the whole fall harvesting, right? right? And that's kind of the extent of what I cover. But I tried to allude to some of those things so people realize that there was a lot in between the, the exciting stuff, right? But a lot of it was boredom. A lot of it was tediousness. A lot of it was just, you know, wor- working hard and breaking your back to make sure you've got enough food and water and provisions to make it through the next season. Yeah, 97% boredom, 3% terror. Right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us the titles of the books you've written? And I'm going to put these down in the description as well. But I'd just like okay. to hear the titles that you've written. Sure, absolutely. So the, the first series I wrote, uh, the name of the series is Marauder. So the first book is just called Marauder. The second book is Valhalla Unleashed. The third book is Realm of Fire. And the fourth one that's coming out this year is going to be called Trials of Asgard. It might change, but that's the name I'm stuck on right now. If you've got a better name, I'm happy to hear it. Um, we also have the Runebinder story I told you about, which, again, it's in the same, uh, essentially the same world, same world building, uh, and same time frame as Marauder, just a different hero, different character, different challenges. And then the last one that I've written is a Civil War novel uh, called When the Drum Stop. Nice. Who publishes these, or do you self-publish? Initially, I self-published. Uh, I did that for, I think, about two years, and then I got picked up by my first publisher. I was with him for about a year. Then I had another publisher that showed up, uh, asked me if I wanted to join on. They gave me a good offer. I joined with them as well. Um, so currently, I'm with Next Chapter Publishing. Great team. They've done some good stuff for me. I think the hardest thing as an author, especially somebody who you know, has a 24-7 job, as it is, uh, and then trying to trying to write on the side is finding time to get things done. And these guys have definitely done it for me where they've taken some of my novels and they've turned them into Audible, right? Because that's kind of the big thing right now is people want to listen to their books because they're stuck in traffic and they don't have time to do other stuff when they're not stuck in traffic. Um, so this company has certainly helped kind of expand my reach and expand my portfolio by creating some of these different segments of my novels and my books. That's awesome. I did not know you'd gone to Audible as well. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you. So, David, I want to thank you for spending time with us and talking to us about your series and how you write and how you go about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You have a good one. You too.